my line. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Nathan Atkins, U.S. Army. Mike Kelly, U.S. Army and President of Nevada Democratic Veterans. Michael Broadway, businessman. Rob Lauer, U.S. Army, President of Newsmax TV, Las Vegas. Christina Ortiz, U.S. Army, Veterans in Politics, Nevada Chapter Director. Mike Edwards, U.S. Marine, President of the Banditos motorcycle club and Mike Armstrong businessman I ask that the panelists announce their names before asking the questions all right I'm going to read the veterans and politics guidelines now trying to stick to a strict timeline. Uh, time is crucial here. So um, I want to remind you for the candidates that this is an interview. It's not a debate. It may feel like a debate because you're all up there at the same time, but it's not. It, it is an interview. The panelists will have 30 seconds to ask their questions and the candidates will have one minute to answer. I'm going to try to keep time to keep you to the one minute answers. And I have a guest on the panel who also will be helping me keep time. If we call time on you, you'll be allowed to finish your sentence, but please don't go on and on about it. Each panelist will be allowed one question per interview. The question will be directed to one candidate, unless the question can be answered in a yes or no fashion. Again, the panelists will have 30 seconds for their questions. If time permits, we'd be happy to take questions from our audience members. Okay, I want to just go down the line and, and mention who the candidates are, and I'd like to give each candidate 30 seconds to introduce themselves. I know you all have a lot of accomplishments, but if you can stick to the 30 seconds, that would be appreciated. So we'll start with Sam Bateman. Thank you. Is this on? You guys can hear me okay? Great. My name is Sam Bateman. I'm running for Henderson Justice Court. Uh, I am currently a Chief Deputy District Attorney with the Clark County District Attorney's Office. I've been in uh, that position for the last 12 years. Before that, I was in private practice. I went to law school here. I was in the second class of the William S. Boyd School of Law. I'm also on the Henderson City Council. I've been elected twice to the Henderson City Council representing Ward 4. We run at large, and so I represent the exact same residents uh, in, as, in my position as a Henderson City Council person as uh, I would as a Henderson Justice of the Peace. So I'm uh, respectfully requesting your vote. I think I'm the person that has dedicated in both my career and my personal time to protecting and serving the residents of the city of Henderson. I also want to give a shout out to Mark, Judge Mark Stevens is in the crowd. Uh, he's a great judge, of course, in uh, the city of Henderson. Thank you. Let's go to Shane Zeller. Thank you. I'm Shane Zeller. I grew up here in Henderson. Been here my whole life. I went to UNLV for my undergrad, attended Southwestern Law School for uh, my Juris Doctorate, moved back to Henderson and have been working at the Public Defender's Office ever since. Um, through that experience, I've handled thousands of cases ranging from DUI to murder. Um, so I'm well versed in the criminal justice system. And through my experience, I have decided to run as a judicial candidate on three main pillars, uh, decisiveness, compassion, and reducing recidivism. And I believe I have the tools in order to do that in Henderson. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for having us here today. My name is Jeffrey Posen. I've been practicing law for 22 years. Um, I've been in the Las Vegas Henderson community since 1995. Um, and I've had my private practice for almost 20 years now. In my practice, I not only do criminal defense work, uh, handle everything from murder cases on down to the most basic petty cases, uh, petty larcenies and, and things of that nature. I also handle a large civil calendar which is something I think differentiates myself from some of the candidates where I have extensive experience in both civil and criminal uh, matters, which is important in the Justice Court, which a lot of people unfortunately don't recognize.
recognize that about half of the justice court is civil, um, about half is criminal, and I think I bring the experience both in life as well as legal legal experience to the bench that would uh, be able to handle that job better than anyone else. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Gail Nathan. I've been practicing law for 27 years. During those 27 years, I have been a Justice of the Peace pro tem for North Las Vegas for over five years. I've been a hearing master pro tem for child support court. I was elected to the district court and sat on the family court bench for four years. I'm currently a short trial judge, and I'm a hearing master for the Clark County School District. I bring all of that judicial experience to this Justice of the Peace position. I have tried um, hundreds of cases. I have civil experience as well as criminal experience. I believe that I'm the most qualified candidate for this position, and I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Next, we have Harvey Gruber. Good morning. My name's Harvey Gruber. My name's Harvey Gruber. I want to thank all of you for having us here today. I'm running for Henderson Justice Court, Justice of Peace, Part One. I've been a resident of Henderson for 19 years. I've been practicing in that courthouse for 19 years. I have an office on Water Street in downtown Henderson. I can safely say that I am probably the busiest private attorney in that courthouse. I've seen all cases, criminal and civil. I've handled all of those cases in my practice. Married, I have two kids and two rescue dogs at home. Okay, next we have Michael Davidson. Thank you, thank you all for coming out to this beautiful occasion. Uh, it's clear that this dais was arranged in increasing order of age and experience. <laughs> I've been in the Valley practicing law for 38 years. I started first 20 years in private practice. I served as your assistant district attorney, the number two guy in the district attorney's office where I ran the whole civil and family divisions. Uh, I served as the chief prosecutor in North Las Vegas for five years. Uh, I'm probably the only one up here who has actually served as a prosecutor, a defense counsel, and as a judge. The Supreme Court appointed me as a Supreme Court Settlement Conference judge. I may be the only one, there may be one other up here, I think, that also holds the highest rating that any lawyer can earn. That's the AV preeminent Martindale Hubble rating, as well as the Perfect Ten uh, AVO rating. Uh, when you pick judges, my suggestion is, Pick the best lawyers, pick people who are going to have the experience and the judgment to do what's right and to protect this community and to protect individual citizens' constitutional rights. Thank you. Okay, let's start with our questions. Who would like to start in the panel? Why don't we start on the far end and we'll come down with questions. Please introduce yourself, your name before asking your question. Um, well, I wasn't prepared to go first. Uh, my name is Steven Sonnenberg. Uh, I'm a businessman in the community. Um, it, it, the speaker's not very loud, okay. so... There you go. Is that better? We just speak with us. Okay, my name's Steven Sonnenberg. Uh, I am a businessman in the community for about 25 years. Um, Thank you all for showing up. Um, was not prepared to go first, so. If, if you want to give us a second, Steve, I'll go. Right. Okay. All right. Good. Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good uh, morning. My name is Mike Edwards. I'm a United States uh, Marine Desert Storm veteran, and um, I'm president of the, the local Ben Dio Chapter Motorcycle Club. That was just. Hold it up to your mouth. That was just awarded. Okay. It's really not going to make a difference. So, uh, we, yeah, we just uh, we were voted. Uh, there's a award of veterans of the uh, volunteers of the year by the state of Nevada, from uh, Harry Reid, uh, Crescent Hardy, Joe Heck, and Dina Titus for our work with the homeless vets and St. Jude's Children's Ranch. Uh, my first question today, I'll start the end, uh, Mr. Davidson, sir. Um, uh, June of last year, uh, District Attorney Wolfson he uh, petitioned uh, the uh, the Nevada Supreme Court to stop the Veterans Court um, on at the municipal and the justice court level, sir. Uh, do you support the district attorney's position that only a district court could create and operate a veterans court or other specialty court? I'm, I'm aware of the situation and I'll tell you that I see no reason why veterans court should not apply and be used at the initial stages of a prosecution. That's where it makes the most difference. 
I can only presume, because I haven't spoke to, to Steve, spoken to Steve, but I can only presume that he is seeking to clarify the law on this. I would hope that his position is that it makes sense to have the Veterans Court intervene at the various early stages uh, of a prosecution. There's no reason for a veteran to have to go through the initial appearances in municipal court or in justice court only to have the benefit of the Veterans Court processes in district court. Thank you, sir. Who has the next question? Raise your hand. Christina. My name is Christina Ortiz, and, and I'm a U.S. Army veteran and the VIP uh, radio co-host in Nevada State Chapter. My next question is for Sam Bateman. What do you, how do you feel that your platform will help veterans and their, um, their challenges that they face in the courts, and do you have a recommendation to help veterans in the challenges they face at courts? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I've actually, uh, I got with, I don't know, if Judge Stevens is still here. Um, I'd actually talked to Judge Stevens a few weeks ago about having a little bit more of a formal process from uh, Henderson Justice Court and dealing with uh, our veterans that come into the Henderson Justice Court and trying to divert them to Veterans Court. Since we don't have a, a Henderson uh, Veterans Justice Court Veterans Court, and yet we have the most successful Veterans Court basically upstairs from the Henderson Justice Court, uh, with, with Judge Mark Stevens. Uh, I've talked to him about setting up a formal process where we can divert uh, those people that come into the Henderson Justice Court to his courtroom, either through, and I think I'm uniquely qualified to do that. Uh, number one, that's going to take cooperation from the district attorney's office. I'm currently a chief deputy district attorney, and so I understand the process and have the relationships to be able to uh, manage getting the, uh, what I think is a great, uh, a large group of veterans in Justice Court up into uh, Judge Stevens' Uh, Veterans Court. Additionally, I have the relationship with the city attorney's office. I've already spoken with the assistant city attorney about possibly per participating in this process. So uh, that's what uh, I plan on doing as a justice of the peace. Thank you. Next question. Good morning. My name is Robert Faust. I'm a Las Vegas businessman and former U.S. Army Airborne soldier. Um, I have a question basically for the whole court. Seeing how this is going to be court, and you're going to be the first time judges on it, what's your vision for the court? And I'd like to ask each of you this question and just a very brief answer. What's your vision for this new court? Mr. Zeller? Thank you, Robert, and thank you for your service. Um, my vision is really to implement more specialty programs in Henderson Justice Court. As you've heard, there's Veterans Court in Municipal Court, there's a Veterans Court in Las Vegas Justice Court, but there's no Veterans Court in Henderson Justice Court, and I think that's a big problem. Um, my number one goal would be to institute that in Henderson Justice Court. Um, that's a very good answer, thank you, sir. Oh, okay, Mr. Thank you. Bateman. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I will say that uh, Judge Burr, who vacated the seat, was getting 95% in the Review Journal ratings. And he's a very, very good judge, and I would only hope that I can, uh, can carry on as good a job as he's been doing over the course of time. I think in, in relation specifically to veterans, I think the Henderson Justice Court needs to get out into the community a little bit more and inter interact with veterans groups to understand and have a dialogue about what they're seeing on a you know a day-to-day -day basis because trends change and so that the judges can be educated uh, when you know uh, landlord tenant issues come in someone might be on the verge of losing their their home or with criminal cases so that would be my my goal. thank you mr Bateman. mr posen when we're giving a question for the entire panel it should be on a yes or no basis uh, otherwise we'll have to limit it am i okay to go yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll cut it off after this question since we've gone down the line already. Yeah, my, my vision is, is kind of too far. I do agree with Mr. Bateman that we need to expand the Veterans Court. We can take advantage of the resources that Judge Stevens has already set up in his, in his courtroom. But I think there's a need for expanded services to veterans, in particular in the community as large, for <clears throat> crimes and, and, and first-time offenders that are reaching the system that aren't as serious, that aren't going to go into a veterans program that's going to be a year program. There's an opportunity to get veterans and get uh, people off the streets, homeless veterans, to get veterans who have suicidal tendencies or job problems into programs and services that are available already that they don't know about. Uh, my understanding uh, from the, the people I've talked to is that 
there are many services out there, but reaching the veterans is, is the problem. They can't get the services to the veterans, and I think that's where we can step in and help them do that. Thank you, Mr. Posen. Ms. Ms. Nathan. Yes, thank you. I read the statute. The statute clearly says that defendants need to be referred to the district court for, uh, to be put into diversionary programs. So the first thing we have to do is go to the legislature and change the statute so the justice court has control over diversionary programs. I'm a great supporter of diversionary programs because they work. Statistics show they work. So um, I would cer certainly be on board with going to the legislature first to change the statute so that we have more power, more authority to create more diversionary programs. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, my vision for the court is a couple of things. One, to get more specialty programs in there. I've had clients who I've had to divert from Justice Court to Judge Stevens Municipal Court Veterans Court program. It's not an easy process to do. I've had to do it from other courts as well into different veterans courts. The Justice Court needs something more streamlined to help veterans get, get there. Additionally, I find that a lot of time in court is waiting waiting for your case, it's, it's time waste, a lot of time waste. I'd like to streamline the process, better calendar timing, stuff like that, so that coming to court isn't a chore or a burden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ditto to all the good ideas everybody else had. Uh, but let me add one other thing for you. I'm a firm believer that courts work only when citizens have confidence in those courts. I've been doing this 40 years, and what I've seen is an erosion in the confidence that citizens have in the functioning of our courts. That concerns me. And so I think that all judges need to make sure that people understand that although prosecutors work closely with police and judges promise the safety of the community, it's important that every citizen understands that the individual rights of citizens are also not lost in the whole process. If we forget that, we're going to lose confidence in our court systems. Thank you very much. That was a great answer. All right. Turning back to the panel, who has the next question? My name is Nathan Atkins, and I'm a U.S. Army veteran. Uh, my question, I believe, is for Shane. Shane, is that your name? Yes. So, Shane, you said uh, decisiveness, um, compassion, and reduction in recidivism. So clearly we have a lot of veterans who are flowing through the system based on needs, whether it be homeless, whether they suffer PTSD. What specifically will you do if you're appointed to enact these three principles that you spoke on concerning veteran needs and issues? So having staffed, thank you, Mr. Atkins, and thank you for your service. Having staffed Veterans Court and Las Vegas Justice Court for the past six years, um, I've seen a lot of great things that Veterans Court can do and a lot of things that Veterans Court needs help doing. And I think the number one thing that I spoke to Robert about is implementing that Veterans Court in Henderson. If the crime's committed in Henderson, chances are that veteran lives in Henderson. They cannot always find transportation to go to Las Vegas Justice Court to attend Veterans Court for a year. That's a big problem. So my goal, um, as far as compassion goes, is to have compassion for that first-time offender, for offenders who have a military background people who have drug issues, to impose uh, court-sanctioned requirements and also court-sanctioned oversight to watch this person, to impose veterans court, drug court, to make sure that they're staying on the right path and continue to be a product, uh, productive member of society. As far as decisiveness, decisiveness goes, I'm in court a lot. I see a lot of judges put a sanction on somebody, and then they hear a lot of excuses and sometimes a lot of lies and they back off that decision because of what that person says. Through my experience, I've heard the excuses, I've heard many lies and some truths, and so I'm able to uh, listen to what they're saying and make a decision based on what they're saying and implement that so that we steer them to being a productive member of society and not allowing them to come back in front of the court again, again, and again. I have a yes or no question for if all you of you. you can introduce yourself first. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, but speak louder. My name is Michael Broadway. I'm a <coughs> real estate broker and uh, do a lot of investments here locally as well as right across the Hoover Dam in Arizona. Um, I am going to ask yes or no question. Are you guys pro-gun or anti-gun? Mr. Zeller, start with you and work our way down. Pro-gun. Pro-Second Amendment right. 
I think it's a little more complicated than that. Um, so I, I would I would say that I'm pro gun for people who are responsible, but but I'm not pro gun across the board widely. Well, the question was pro gun or not pro gun? Pro gun. <laughs> Pro Second Amendment. Pro Second Amendment CCW holder. Next panelist, please. Good morning. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming out here so we can actually badge you a little bit. It's, it's kind of fun for us being on this side because a lot of us uh, have seen you guys in court and uh, <laughs> have worked with some of you, so it's, it's, it's fun for us to play with you here today. So thank you for coming out. My name is Staff Sergeant Jason Brooks, United States Marine Corps retired. Hoorah, combat veteran, Iraq, 100% disabled veteran, 90% uh, combat disability rated. So I was born and raised here, spent my whole life here. I do uh, work with the Veterans Court Treatment Programs with Judge Stevens. I've been in uh, Judge Hastings Court before. Uh, I've worked with the Wounded Warrior Project. I've run uh, peer support groups three times a month for Wounded Warriors. I volunteer at Lake Nick Christian Academy, which you passed time. on the way out here. <laughs> do, do a lot of work in the community. RWB dog tags, help out with service dogs, as Mr. Gruber and talked about. Is... And the question is, <laughs> when we're talking about the Second Amendment and pro-gun or, or not pro-gun, Mr. Posen said something very interesting, so I want to talk about that. When veterans are dealing with their issues with PTSD and going through the Veterans Court Treatment Program, and once they complete the program, their, their guns are taken away while they're in the program, but then to complete the program, they, they can get their guns back as long as they're, they're on the right track. Do you support that, uh, keeping them away from them uh, while they have the PTSD diagnosis until they get it back under control, or are you just blanket, once you've been diagnosed with PTSD, take their weapons and never give it back to them again? And to whom are you directing the question? Each, each panel member, yes or no, yes for keeping your, your weapons, or no, once you've been diagnosed with PTSD, take it away. But very short on the second, please. Not sure I understood the question as you just said it, but the answer is while they are in treatment and diagnosis, no. Once they've satisfied requirements, they get them back, just like all civil rights get restored, even to felons. Perfect. As long as you've successfully completed any program and there's proof of that, obviously, then I'm in favor of returning to the Thank you. I concur with Mr. Davidson's response. I also agree, while in treatment, no, but get him back after the treatment. So I don't think there's any legal authority to keep a firearm uh, from someone who doesn't fall under certain categories, you know, if it's a felon. So I, I don't see any way in which you even could keep their guns after they completed the program. I think giving those guns during the program is somewhat voluntary so that they make sure that they get through the program and don't have problems, which I think is a good idea. But there's no legal authority for anybody to keep their guns afterwards, so absolutely give them that. I'm all for listening to the staffing members in the Veterans Court Treatment Program. The ADTP counselors and their counselors at the VA, if they say take the guns away while they're going through this counseling, then I'm all for it and absolutely restore that right when they graduate and they get the okay from their counselors. Thank you. that uh, is not a yes or no, but I do need all the panelists to answer. Uh, my question is, does all judges have within their authority to hand down sentences from fines to imprisonment <coughs> and probation? How would you weigh the balance between justice and mercy for first-time offenders versus habitual criminals? All right, let's, let's keep our answers to 45 seconds each. How about that? Thank you. Uh, there's several aspects that go into that question. Obviously, um, criminal record, what those crimes are, whether they're violent, uh, drug, or petty theft. Obviously, if they're drug-related, there's some intervention that can take place in order to help this person get on the right track. Um, if there's violence and habitual violence, uh, prison should be instituted. As a criminal defense attorney, I get a lot of questions. Of how do you defend these people? Well, I'm not defending their... Uh, behavior, but their rights. If someone committed a crime, is found guilty in a fair process, and they have a violent background, they deserve to go to prison, and I'm all for that. Thank you. I think 
think to answer your question, it's really important that you have experience in the very courtroom that you're you're dealing with as a judge. So if you're a practicing lawyer in that courtroom and you've handled those types of cases, I think it makes you gives you context for each and every uh, person that comes in front of the court. As a you know, twelve year practicing chief deputy district attorney, I've been in every justice court and I've had recency of experience. I've been doing it and, I, and currently am doing it. So I think when you have that recency of experience and an extensive uh, sophisticated criminal background. I've tried 34 jury trials, 14 murder trials. I, I know when I look at uh, defendants that come in what the appropriate way to handle them because of the context of experience that I have. And I think that that's something that's very important when you're looking at a judge for a, a, a justice court or any court Thank is that they're sir. is that they're practicing in that court. Thank you. I uh, believe that, that it takes both legal experience as well as life experience to make the right decisions on, on what needs to be done. Um, I think it's an individual case-by-case -case, you know, assessment that has to be made by the judge. Um, I've done, in the 22 years I've been practicing law, everything from murder cases on down to the most basic cases. Um, and I believe that, that that gives you the experience and context, which Mr. Beam was referring to, but I also believe there's a life experience factor that has to be considered, too. When you look at people's problems, you have to be able to, to empathize with them, understand what the issue is, see if there's an alternative to, to jail. I believe prison and, and incarceration should be a last resort in general. I mean, if there's violent crimes, that, that obviously is something that you have no choice on. But, you know, the, the smaller crimes, the ones that we could help to try to change the path, that's something that, that you have to have the ability to, to evaluate on the bench and make a decision if that's something that's to be effective with this person or if it's a waste of time and should be, you know, move on towards you know, other types of punishment that are more severe like incarceration. In my 27 years of practicing law, <laughs> I was a public defender for the first five years. Um, and throughout my career, I've practiced criminal law. And as Mr. Posen said, life experience really counts here, too. I've, I've talked to and represented thousands of people. I've had probably thousands of people come before me as a family court judge as well. And so, you know, nobody appears before you in a vacuum when they come into court. You know, they have their family, they have their friends, they have their colleagues. Um, and all of those, you know, when it comes time to sentencing, they can have a voice in the sentencing. Who, you know, what is this person's character? What does this person's future look like? And all those things come into account when it's time to sentence a person. So, you know, what, do, what you. do we weigh? We weigh a lot of different things at the time of sentencing. I think you have to look at someone as a whole, not just what they're there in front of you for. As much as you can when you're sitting as a judge and deciding what sentence to hand out. It's not just drug, drug crimes. A lot of petty theft and, and theft crimes in general because, are because of drug crimes. And so you have to realize that this is just not a thief, but this is someone, there's an underlying problem that you need to get to. Those things you have to realize, and it's not only legal experience, but it is life experience as well. It's, you know, being, you know, having the, the wisdom of seeing stuff over and over again. And so it's yes, practicing and being old enough, realizing what's going on and handling it that way. You've heard good, thoughtful answers from everybody to my right, and I agree with what they said. But you have to decide who is in the best position to make those things happen. I'm the only one up here who has served on all three of the branches you've heard about. Served as a prosecutor. And by the way, as a prosecutor, I was one of the people charged with making the decision as to who we will seek the death penalty against. So I have direct responsibility, moral obligation, for the dozen or so people on death row who are there because I and a couple of other senior people decided they deserve the death penalty. But I've also defended individual rights, and I've served as a judge for the Supreme Court, uh, for juvenile court, and as a small claims master. And so when you're picking somebody, pick somebody who has the experience as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, and as a judge. I'm the only one here who has made all of those decisions and has the perspective to Thank protect you. the rights of individuals while protecting society as well. I do apologize. My name is Michael James Armstrong, Jr., and I'm a business owner here in Southern Nevada. Thank you all. Next panel question. We'll start going in order now. Do you see I'll ask a question. You ready yet? I think so. <laughs> okay, so question one is coming up on this upcoming election. Um, so yes or no for 
everybody up there on the panel. Um, are you for? Oh, I thought I already did that. Okay. All right, my name is Steven Sonnenberg. Uh, I'm a businessman in the community. My question is, is question one is coming up on the upcoming election. Are you for question one? Yes or no? And that question is for everybody on the panel. Again, 45 seconds. Remind me what question one is, please. The uh, the gun rights with signing on uh, background the background checks. I am in favor of background checks for people who are asking to have guns. I don't believe that guns should be available to everybody. So yes, background. I'm in favor of background checks. I'm also in favor of background checks. I'm also in favor of background checks. I have concerns about question one. So as of right now, I'm still uh, looking into all of the ramifications of question one, which deals with a variety of issues regarding background checks. I think it's easy to say you're against, you're for background checks, but I think that the specific language of the initiative is something that people need to look at and see whether it infringes upon Second Amendment rights or not. I think it's a tricky situation. Obviously, we don't want to infringe on anyone's Second Amendment rights, but we're all for background checks. But I can tell you, from my experience, most of my clients who commit crimes with a gun is purchased illegally or they have it illegally. And making it more stringent for someone to buy a gun can sometimes increase the black market and could cause issues. So I think it's a very tricky situation, but I am for background checks. Thank you. Next panel member. Rob Lauer from a, I'm sorry, Newsmax TV and Los, I'm also a U.S. Army veteran. What I'd like to ask each and every one of you is to answer which U.S. Supreme Court justice currently on the bench do you most associate with, um, admire, and then, and why? 45 seconds. Go ahead and start. I would say Scalia, but he's dead, so. Um, can I say Scalia? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Alito. You need to say why. Oh, is it a why too? Yeah, I think why don't we start from the okay, beginning. Apologize. I apologize because I'm for the Constitution and I think the Constitution is one of the most brilliant pieces of writing we have in history and I think we need to abide by it. Let me amend my answer a little bit. Um, I, I like Alito's uh, background uh, in, in criminal justice and I think he brings it uh, to his opinions, but I also like. Uh, not necessarily on some issues, but I like the way that Justice Breyer writes some of his opinions because it's very clear and concise and, and it, easy to read for the average reader. And so I think that you know you as a judge have to take into account necess not necessarily uh, philosophy, but also uh, this, this the way they make it available. So just yeah. to clarify. Okay. I, I would, you know, I, I think, like I said, I, I like the fact that uh, Lito, where he comes on criminal justice issues. I'm going to cheat a little bit and say, former Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, he was actually one of my professors in law school and uh, had deep conversations with each other and debates with each other. And uh, I respect, I respected his ability to listen to both sides of, of issues um, and base his opinion on, on all the facts. And, and that was my personal experience with him. And, and I, I respected the way he looked at issues and the way he evaluated. But what about someone presently on the court? Well, I don't know. Um, have to, honestly, I have to really think about it. I haven't really thought about that question before. Um, yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I, I, I have to really put some thought into it. Look at the issues of each Thank judge you. or justice. I don't really have an answer right off the top of my head at this time. I'm sorry. As you asked the question as it was coming down here, I was thinking to myself on the bench, who it? And I think it's Justice Kennedy. Um, I find that his philosophy is, it, is, I think, more conservative on the criminal matters, but very socially more liberal. And I think how we live our lives has to be a little bit open more than just a strict, uh, a, a, a strict reading sometimes. Um, and in that respect, I, I do. Kennedy and, and uh, Mr. Bateman said Breyer is easy to read. A tough question, and I, and I tell you I'm a constitutional scholar, and I say that in the sense that I've been studying the writings of justices for decades. 
there is no one justice who I would say is my favorite justice. I will say that I, I like Kennedy's position at the moment simply because he's the one in the middle of the court now. You've got four justices on the right, four on the left. Kennedy ends up deciding most of the decisions of any import lately. And that puts him in the position of having to actually carefully consider both sides, knowing that he's the swing vote. I like judges who understand that you can't be doctrinaire. You have to carefully consider the positions on both sides and eliminate the political considerations. All right, thank you. Next question from our panel. All right. My name's Robert Faust. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. It's very good of you to come out. I have a hypothetical question for you. It's gonna be a yes or no question. If you were hearing a case and there was a decision to be made, a judgment to be issued on money, a substantial amount of money, could you possibly make that decision and award a judgment ex parte? Mr. Zeller, first, please. Could you explain to me what you mean by making the decision ex parte? With, without you walk into the judge's with, office and say, I want a judgment on this person, and the judge grants it. Oh, as the attorney. Would you ever do that? Oh, as the attorney. No, as the, as the judge, would oh. you issue that judgment? Yes no, absolutely no? not. Not ex parte. Mr. Bateman, please. No, sir. Not, not only wouldn't I, I think it's illegal to do that. Thank you very much. That's how judges lose their job. <laughs> say what? That's how judges lose their job. No, you don't do that. Thank you. Hell no. Thank you. Next question, please. Good afternoon. Thank you again. Uh, Mike Edwards, United States Marine Corps. Um, a lot of military personnel, before, during, and after their careers, uh, uh, join motorcycle clubs for the brotherhood that they may be lacking, um, to deal, help deal with their PTSD, for that camaraderie, for the, uh, just the brotherhood that, that comes with being a part of an organization. Um, clubs, uh, they provide you know, a common good. They help bring a lot of people back into civilian life. Um, so it helps with their PTSD. And, uh, but a lot of motorcycle clubs have uh, been profiled lately uh, by a lot of overzealous uh, police officers. I found Las Vegas is right on the, the, the forefront of being a lot better. Um, Washington State and Maryland have recently uh, got uh, anti-profiling bills, motorcycle anti-profiling bills that have passed within the last year or two. What are, what are your uh, views? I'm going to direct this to Mr. Gruber. Excuse me, sir. Um, if someone comes into the court, whether military or not, <coughs> that they're being profiled, or if they have to come before a jury, um, it's hard to get a non-tainted jury because a lot of people watch Sons of Anarchy and a lot of these fake shows <laughs> that, you know, you would think that, you know, we're, we're out, you know, doing drugs and having prostitutes every single night, which, you know, myself, my brother back here, he's a Vietnam veteran, uh, Marine Corps, never, we've never been arrested in our lives. We do a lot of good for the community. What are you, your views upon that, sir? Mr. Gruber? Thank you. Uh, one, no one should be profiled, and that's just, that has to be out. Um, two, just so we're clear, there isn't a jury in justice court. It's just going to be the judge deciding that. And um, so, in, in my respect, in my experience, in representing many people who some are in clubs, in gangs, and some are not, you, you cannot, as a judge, sit there and be, when they walk in or when they stand up, have in your head already what's going on. And the police shouldn't do it when they're arresting people either. Thanks, sir. Next question. Amen. Hi, uh, my name is Christina Ortiz again. A lot of veterans come here um, seeking a better life and, uh, and a better education for their children. And you as judges will now have a play in that as we see if the Supreme Court um, ruling, the ruling on the education bill that's supposed to be passed down at any moment. And how do you guys feel about that? Who is it? That's for all the panel, 45 seconds or less. Yes. I you ask me a specific question, please? On the education bill that is supposed to be coming down, how do you guys feel about that? Which aspect of it? Um, the aspect of putting the money back into the parents' hands. Are oh, you talking about the state education yeah. bill? 
First, understand that that's not an issue that even remotely comes up in justice court, although no judge can tell you what he or she might rule on an issue which is likely to come before the court. So you're going to get you know, vacillation on it. Um, I think that's a very complicated issue, and, and I haven't really decided which way I come down on it. I respect the ability for families and parents to make individual decisions concerning their children, uh, but by the same token, I'm a product of public education, and I would hate to see the public education system be gutted. The truth of the matter is that uh, the majority of veterans are not people of great means and are going to depend on the public education system to educate their children. And so it's a difficult issue, uh, not susceptible to you know, a 10 second answer. I haven't read the whole, I haven't read the law, so I can't answer it at this point, but it should not take one penny away from the public schools. You can't take any money away from our educational system as is right now. We can't get any lower, so we need to go up, not down. I don't really have an answer for you. I mean, if, if parents are allowed to take their kids out of public school, then that's what they're going to do. My children were educated in the schools in Henderson. I think the schools did a great job. Um, I'm, I'm happy with the education my children received in the city of Henderson. And uh, I, don't, I don't really have a position on it, Christine. I do I think it's a complicated question. Um, my kids were in private school in Henderson for first you know, eight years of, the, of education, and then now they're high school students in Henderson in the public school system. Um, so I've seen both sides of it. The, the problem is that the ed public education system in Nevada, in Clark County in particular, is, is, is lacking. Um, and so I understand the need or the feeling for parents to want to put their kids into a private education or to have, to have some kind of choice, because I made that choice for my children. So, so it is a complicated question, but the problem is, is if you, you take all the money out of the public education system and put it into the hands of private schools, you're going to further gut the public education system. So unless they can come up with a way to fully fund the public schools, I think that creates, creates problems long term. So. Uh, to your question on the issue that's in front of the Supreme Court, I guess we're all going to end up having to live with uh, whatever the Supreme Court says. And it certainly as a judge, that's kind of the tenet of being a judge, is to live with what the Supreme Court says. That's the precedent. Um, I will say as a city council person in Henderson, we've worked really hard with our schools to, to provide more options. We're, we've been very aggressive in supporting charter schools and private schools, uh, opening it all across uh, the city of Henderson. And, and it's been particularly important because the economy since 2009 didn't allow the school district to build new schools. Luckily, they're now doing that. We're going to have three new schools in the city of Henderson. But for the last five years that I've been on the city council, I've been working really hard to diversify uh, the options in the city of Henderson for uh, uh, education, both at the grade school level and actually higher education as well. Thank you. I'm a product of Henderson Public School. And I currently sit on the uh, chairman of the board for Nevada State High School, which is a charter school here in Henderson. And I have friends who went to private school. I think it's great that people are finally getting a choice of where they send their kids to school. I think it's about time the state's putting real money into education but I don't want it to come at the detriment of public schools. So as long as we're properly funding public schools, I think it's great that the uh, families are finally getting a choice. Okay, again, my name is uh, Michael James Armstrong Jr. and I'm a businessman here in Southern Nevada. Uh, this question kind of follows up with where Mike Edwards is going regarding profiling. I also ride a motorcycle where Bash says we do know how that feels out there at times. But let's bring it home and make it a little more personal because of the other type of profiling that I could receive and have received without uh, fairness in my life. So in my lifetime. So my question is, and for all panelists, because this is a snapshot, uh, how you guys think and feel, what your philosophy, values, and character is for your community. So my question is, is do you believe that blacks, Hispanics, and other minorities contribute to the highest amount of major and minor crimes in Henderson? And if so, how do you balance sentence, sentencing without bias or prejudice? And this is for all. Uh, honestly, the majority of my clients coming out of Henderson are white. And I don't know if that's because of the population that lives in Henderson, but the majority of the offenders that I represent in Henderson are white. If you go in the justice court in the mornings, um, the box is full 
you'll see some black and some Hispanic, but mostly white. Um, I don't think that, as a judge, I would have any bias towards any one of ethnicity. I represent all members of uh, the community, indigent. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't have any bias towards anybody. As a prosecutor, I don't. I have it as an obligation to not take uh, ethnicity into account to treat everyone equally and fairly under the law and I would do that as a judge as well. I can tell you in terms of generally speaking criminal justice reform I've been involved in since 2008. I served as the Nevada District Attorneys Association le legislative liaison to the legislature. I've been to the legislature and, and advocated on, on behalf of a whole host of uh, uh, public safety policies and criminal justice reform. I've uh, participated in the criminal justice uh, administration. Uh, administration on criminal justice is an interim committee that occurs in between the uh, uh, the, the uh, legislature sessions on any all sorts of uh, sentencing issues, uh, uh, eyewitness identification issues. So I've been involved in, in issues that relate to criminal justice generally, uh, and I think that that also takes into account some of the issues with regard to uh, ethnicity and how those play out in the criminal justice system. I've been doing that since 2008. Thank you. I, I personally think this is a real problem, and I think it's a problem in Henderson in particular. Um, you know, I've had a real problem, and, and I say this as a white guy who's running for judge, and, and if I'm able to win, it would be six white males on the benches in Henderson between municipal court and justice court. I, I, I find that that's, that's unusual <laughs> to have all white, you know, uh, just, you know, judges in, in all six departments in Henderson. I think there is a, you know, a systematic problem, though, with, with profiling, with racism. And I don't think it's it's as easy to say, well, obviously no one likes to think of themselves as a racist. Everyone likes to say, well, I'll be colorblind, and, and I, I believe I would be. But I do think it's more of a systematic problem, though, that goes down throughout the system. And I think that this is something that has to be addressed at the youngest ages to try to get minorities into the, the, the legal fields and into the positions that could lead to them being judges in the future. As an elected judge, I went up to judicial college uh, for a number of weeks as, um, as part of the job that you have to go to judicial college. And we took uh, classes on bias and the innate bias that we all have and how as a judge we have to sh shed that bias because each person who comes before us is an individual. And we have to make sure that we see that person as an individual, that we don't use our instinct, we don't use our bias, we don't use anything except the facts before us to make our decisions. And that, those were really important classes um, to take and to, to understand um, ourselves as judges and how, um, and how there's a real process that goes on there. So, um, so I, I understand as a former judge uh, that each person who comes before me is an individual and, and they stand before me as an individual and um, I, I am confident that I can assess each case without bias. Unfortunately, in representing all walks of life and all ethnicities, I have seen bias by judges in sentencing. It occurs. It is a problem in society. We have to educate people that, that all because they're someone of color doesn't make them inherently more violent. That is the problem here, is that for whatever reason, some people think that a minority is more violent than than me, and I find it, uh, you know, six white guys telling you about racism and, and, and bias here, but based on my experience in the 19 years I've been practicing, I've seen it happen. It, it has to stop, but it's, it's gotta be education. You know, we can all sit here and tell you we're not gonna do it, and that, I believe, to a person here, we would not do that. But society has to change in, in our thinking that that person, because of what his skin color is, is more violent than I am. So let me admit right up front that I don't live your experience, but after having both prosecuted and defended people of all stripes for a long time, I think I have a little bit of an understanding of what you go through. I'm Jewish, and I've lived in parts of this country where I was the minority, and I've experienced uh, what it is that you're talking about. Not the same, but similar. Uh, let me tell you that I used to teach at the police academy and I told the police officers 
25 years ago that they're going to start getting shot at. Uh, unfortunately, that's been happening. And so one of the things that I tried to do when I was teaching at the academy, one of the things that I did when I was the chief prosecutor in North Las Vegas and doing continuing education for the police officers there, was to try to help them break the chain of thought that everybody is a perp and that certain perps are more likely to cause you difficulty than others. That, I think, is why you're seeing so much of the interactions on the street that are going negative. Thank you. Uh, correct. Robert you. Faust, U.S. Army. Recently, Judge James Hardesty uh, had a comment in the paper about bail, regarding bail. And basically, he wants to just go ahead and OR everybody. Um, I'd like to know what your position is on that. With a yes or no, do you agree that bail should be handled by the court or should it be hail, handled by the outside entity? Uh, yes or no, do you support bail and who should handle it? Maybe even it could be deregulated a little bit. Where right now in this state, if you're a bail bondsman, you have to charge 15% for a bond. So everybody is supposedly on an equal playing field. It's probably not how it really works. So would you be opposed to open percentages on bails also? Mr. Davidson first. Again, I'm not quite, you wanted a yes or no answer, but I'm not sure what question you were asking. Do you asking. support bail, yes or no? Bail is a right of every defendant by statute. It is set by judges according to criteria that depend on are you a threat to the community and are you likely to return to court. Those are the criteria that all judges use. It has to be in the hands of the judges. And so, yes, I'm in favor of bail for people who meet the criteria, uh, for the people who do not, who are a threat to the community or are likely not to return to court. They are not entitled to bail. Thank you. Mr. Gruber, just yes or no, do you support bail and do you think that the bail industry should be deregulated a little bit? I support bail. I do find, though, that bail a lot of times victimizes the poor and the homeless. And that's a problem that needs to be looked at. Um, the problem with the deregulation of bail is that you can't have one company doing this and another company doing that because of the ulterior motives and the means of doing that. So you're in favor of fixed regulation? Yes. 15%? Yes. I guess to answer your question, yes, I support bail. I support the courts maintaining their authority over these issues. I uh, saw Judge Harsey give a presentation on this new bail reform that he's talking about, and, and I actually had some real problems with it, and specifically as it affects homeless veterans and homeless people in general. Uh, his proposal is a point system, and if you're homeless, you get two points. If you have no job, you get two points. Um, you know, things of that nature. If you have mental illness, you get two points. So you start off with a system where... Can we just get a yes? Do you support bail? And you, well, would you support deregulation of the industry? Well, I don't support the system that Judge Harsey is proposing, is the first question, uh, I guess, uh, the way it's written, at least. Um, and I have no problem that they want to be more of a free market uh, competitive for bail, for bail uh, rates at the charge. Thank you. Mr. Pope, Mr. Bateman, please. Uh, I, I support judges maintaining discretion regarding bail and not being told by, you know, a, a, a <coughs> matrix what bail should be. As far as deregulation, I know it's regulated by the insurance industry. I would say on the 15%. What you're seeing a lot of right now is, is they're kind of regulating themselves in that they can um, take a percentage of the 15% and they accept payments on the 15%. That's what some bail bonds companies right. are doing as well. So it seems, you know, I don't have a problem with the state legislature looking at that, uh, but it, it sounds like they're, they're finding ways to, to address that right now. Thank you very much. Mr. Zell. As far as the fixed rate, I don't know if 15% is the right rate, but I am not for deregulation. I think there needs to be definite oversight as far as bail goes. But the, the proposal that Mr. Hardesty is putting out there still gives judges discretion. And as long as the judge has their discretion to impose bail, everyone is entitled to bail. Different amounts of bail based on their background and history, but bail. Thank you very much. Is this next? Yeah. I'm, uh, so the purpose of these questions are to try to get a distinct answer from you so we can decide who we're going to support. So mass selection doesn't help us decide. So that being said, I want to ask you what your position is, because this is an issue that will happen and is happening right now in your courthouse. If you have an illegal alien that comes before you, will you grant them bail or will you turn them over to ICE? What is your position on whether an illegal alien who's, committed, who's been arrested for a crime is entitled to bail should get bail or should get turned over to ICE? 
We'll start with Mr. Zeller. Unfortunately, that's outside the judge's discretion. The judge um, always imposes bail, whether an illegal alien or not. If they have an ICE hold, if that person were to bail out, the federal government can then come get him because he's not getting out with that hold on him. And when he's an illegal alien, he will have that ICE hold well, you on definitely him. definitely have the authority to hold them or not. They're not here legally. Absolutely. But if they're, if they're in custody and they have an immigration hold on them, that's federal. And they are not allowed to leave that jail because federal will come pick them up before they're allowed to leave the jail doors. They won't leave. And, and we've gotten to the point where uh, ICE is not putting holds on. Um, and so that's kind of an issue that's ongoing across the country is uh, in our detention centers, um, they're, they're not uh, having ICE put holds on people who are not here legally. So it does become an issue as to whether they're getting out or not getting out. I think we're still as judges obligated to look at the statute and deciding what uh, the bail should be or whether they get an owner of property. Well, if they're here illegally, right. and, and, the, and ICE doesn't even know they exist because they're here illegally, how do they know to put a hold on them? You have to file a paperwork with ICE saying this person's illegally here, he doesn't have citizenship, and turn them over. You have that authority as a judge to enforce the law. We can't, we can't uh, so I want to make sure cut into their time.